begin our meeting now by singing from page 89, Joy to the World, after which Brother Doug Gibson will give our invocation. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we send a farewell to one of your servants. We would like to hope and pray that the Spirit of the Lord will be with us today. We'd also like to give a special blessing to all the other missionaries that are out in the field today. And we hope the Spirit of the Lord will be with all the speakers today. That the things we hear today will inspire us for many, many more years. We know the gospel is true. We know Jesus the Christ. And it's an honor and a blessing to be able to serve you. I say to Christ, amen. I neglected to recognize President Moss on the stand, and we want to welcome him here with us today. He'll be a part of our program a little later. As you know, this is the, toward the end of the year, and tithing settlements will be coming up. Brother Hart who is our uh, ward financial clerk, will be in the clerk's office after this meeting. And he has our year-to-date contribution slips. As you know, this year we're on a new system, and it'll be important for you to get these slips that uh, he has recorded. And he'll be available right after sacrament meeting to hand those out. We'll now prepare for the sacrament by singing from page 221, Upon the Cross of Calvary, after which our ironic priesthood will administer and pass the sacrament.
We'd like to dismiss them if they had so pleased to sit with their parents. I'd like to take this opportunity, being that the bishop has the last word, as he should, in our meeting today, to express my thankfulness to Brother, should I say, Elder Brian Baxter for his fine example. You know, many times the youth don't think that we look to them to be an example, that they only look to us. But not only is Brother Baxter worthy and a fine example of a priesthood holder, but I feel he's had more than his usual share of problems in his family, and he's shown a fine example of leadership to me. And I'd like him to know that that I appreciate him, that I'm going to miss him as he serves his mission, that he has been an example and someone that I look up to as having great faith and a great testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he has added to mine greatly. The program will proceed as follows. Our first speaker will be Sister Baxter, Jill Baxter, who of course, is Elder Baxter's sister, after which we'll hear from President Moss. We will then have a congregational hymn. It may not be on a mountain high. And then Elder Baxter will speak to us, and the closing remarks will be offered by our good Bishop Beardall. Ye sons of God, go forth. Sound a call to all the earth, as a witness to mankind, help the lost their way to find, in this a dispensation of fullness of times. Ye sons of Adam, arise, lift your voices to the skies, be defenders of the faith, like the father of your race, in this a dispensation of fullness of times. Ye sons of Israel, prepare, make each soul on earth aware. <clears throat> Send your cry into the world, gospel standard is unfurled, in this a dispensation of fullness of times. Christ has paid the price for all by atonement from the fall. Now he says we must go forth to teach each nation on the earth and hail the dispensation of the fullness of times. Exactly 19 years, two months, and 25 days ago, Brian was born. At this time, my mom and dad hoped and prayed to be able to supply the love and attention that this baby boy needed and not knowing at this time the trials and obstacles in his life that, it, that he would go through. Brian grew up in a home where the gospel was lived daily. He attended primary and Sunday school and was also active in scouting. When he turned eight years old, he was baptized and confirmed a member of the church by his father. In 1976, our family had to adapt to a new way of living around home their parents separated. At this time, all four of his children were in our mother's custody. When Brian was 14 and after a few experiences around home, it was decided that he should be near his dad. Within a year, Brian was coming over on Sundays for dinner and for family night. Even though we didn't see each other often, Brian, Cheryl, Grant, and I were growing closer. In just the past couple of years, Brian has done a tremendous amount of growing. It was plainly noticed by the way he continually kept up his standards that mom and dad taught and stressed in all of our lives. My dad's wife, Jeannie, has also shared and sacrificed for Brian's sake. It was she who had times questioned where Brian would sleep in on Sundays a few years ago and not make it to church. In both mine and Brian's patriarchal blessings, we are told that if we live the gospel, and set good examples, our dad and his new family would be influenced by the way in which we lived and acted. Brian is, Brian is very much his own individual. He has chosen to go on this mission. It was his choice to stay close to his family and to the Lord. I want Brian to know that without him, I don't know, I, I don't know if I could have made it the past couple of months with my mom being in an accident. He's been a real strength to me, and I want him to know how much I love him. 
I'd like to bear my testimony that I know that this gospel is true and I'm so proud of Brian. He's really, I really, really look up to him and he's very special to me. In closing, I'd like to read something that my mom has prepared to say, for me to say. My dear family and friends, you are responsible for making this special day for Brian possible. Brian's father and I waited a long time for him to come to us. It was a special day when Brian was born, the first Baxter boy in 30 years and the first to serve in the mission field. Brian has had the privilege of growing up in a home where the gospel is a natural way of life. Brian had many wonderful teachers in primary and Sunday school, all of who should take credit for this important step he is taking. He has been guided by such wonderful bishops, Bishop Brown, Bishop, Bishop Ward, Bishop Gordon Moss, Bishop Peterson, and Bishop Beard, all combined with all of his priesthood advisors. Brian also had the privilege of growing up in a neighborhood with three LDS families, the Gibson, Snows, and the Hughes. His neighborhood friends have also played an important part in his life. I am deeply grateful to all of you who have supported and influenced Brian's life. I know that when he goes on his mission, he will have many opportunities to grow strong and disciplined. His testimony will strengthen by giving service to the Lord, which will in turn influence the lives of others. I am very proud of Brian. He has brought me such joy and happiness, being such an important part of my life. I know he will be a good missionary because of his love for the Lord and for others. I want to thank you again for all you have done for my family. I love you and miss you all. It is my prayer that I will be with you someday soon. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brethren and sisters, I've looked forward to this day for about 14 years. And uh, from the looks of your presence here today, I know you have too. This is always a special time in a young man's life. And it's a time of reunion. A time when people who love and have a special place in their heart for a young man of the church gather together to give him support, to share their love, and to bless his bon voyage. I guess that isn't the right word in Spanish, but it's close enough. Brian Baxter is a very special young man. It would be my hope, and I am disappointed that my own boys aren't here today. There's illness in our family. It would be my hope that my sons would turn out like Brian Baxter. He is a tremendous tribute and honor to his parents and his family. And carries a great heritage and a great tradition and will make a great impact in the work of the Lord and in the world. In trying to prepare some remarks for today, my mind went back to when I first remember Brian. My family uh, moved into this area in 1969. And I believe I was Brian's bishop when he was baptized. I'm not sure it was right about then I became bishop of the Lakewood Second Ward. And Brian was about eight at that point in time. I don't know whether he remembers either. But I can remember the very, from the very first time I met him, I recognized in him a rare quality of human being. He's a leader. 
in a very special way, not the kind of a flashy leader that we often think of, but he's a strong leader. He has served as the president and in key leadership positions in priesthood quorums and other activities that he's participated in. He was my own teaching companion for a couple of years. I can recall going to pick him up regularly. And we'd have a word of prayer together and I think Brian, we took turns on that. Brian kept the record of our home teaching visits. He's the one who kept on top of things for me and he would remind me each time which things we'd done last time and what we needed to follow up on and who gave the lesson and who gave the prayer, what we needed to do. He kept me on the straight and narrow in that respect and I appreciated it. He was a very helpful leader to me as an ironic priesthood bearer. He'd always call the families and arrange for our visit, make an appointment with them. And he always gave an outstanding lesson when it was his turn. I remember we always enjoyed the pie and ice cream we had after our home teaching. We'd go down to Hoff's hut and I'd try to make Brian sick on a hot fudge Sunday. I don't know that I ever really accomplished it. He put them away pretty well. But I always appreciated the excuse to go down there, even though I shouldn't have been eating them. Brian's an athlete. Um, one of the first times I can remember noticing Brian in athletics was when we had a primary baseball team. That was back when we used to have fast pitch, hardball, overhand pitching in primary baseball. And I know that when Brian was there and pitched, we won. And when Brian wasn't there because he had a little league game or something, we usually lost. And I can remember frantically sitting in the stands one time with Max, his dad, and trying to put a, a lens back in his glasses that had popped out so that he could see to the home plate where to pitch the ball so that we could go on with the game. I remember Dick Hart was one of the umpires there and he didn't help us too much. <laughs> Brian's a scholar. He's a very intelligent young man, has a bright mind, very alert. I don't know for a fact what his grades are in school, but I'm sure they're very good. I know that Brian Baxter scored a very, very high score on the language aptitude exam that he took in preparation for his mission. In fact, I haven't seen a higher one. And he's just everything a mission president would dream of to have come into his mission field. He's uh, a handsome young man. He's bright. He's spiritual. He's a good leader and a good follower. I was impressed last week as we heard from Elder Kioa in his testimony as he left our ward. Either he wasn't here long enough or I don't attend often enough in this ward. <laughs> a very, very fine missionary. One I think that has many of the qualities that Brian has. And Brian, I hope you paid good attention to Elder Kyo and his testimony. You've seen lots of good full-time missionaries come through our ward and share their blessings with us. And I'm sure that that will continue to be the case. I've been impressed with Brian's love for his family. He has a lot of tenderness in his heart. I've especially been impressed with the tenderness he's shown his younger brother, Grant. Grant's also a very special young man. I was always a little brother in my family and had a big brother to look up to and a big brother to kind of look out for me. Some of his sons are in our stake. 
in our ward. And I appreciate the influence of a big brother and what impact and influence a big brother can have in a little brother's life. And I'm sure Brian's influence with Grant will be long lasting. I've been impressed with the protection that he has shown to his sisters, Jill and Cheryl. He's looked out for them like a big brother would, like a big brother should. I'm sure he's been a pain and they've been a pain a few times to each other, but that's part of living, that's part of life, and I suppose we should expect some of that. But there's a special place in his heart. I've watched him look after them. I know he has great love and respect for his father. Ryan's father is a great man, and I have great love and respect for his father too. In many ways, Brian is much like his father. And I know of the great compassion and tenderness he has in his heart for his mother, who has great love for him and who unfortunately can't be here today, but I'm pleased that Brian's message will be available to her on videotape. And for his, the rest of his family, see his grandparents here, and others who have great love and interest in him as family members. We appreciate each of you and the part that you've played in his life to bring him to this point. Sending a missionary off uh, always reminds me of going on my mission. 22 years ago, I went on a mission. At that time, my mother wrote my talk. I was 20 years old. Had to be 20 then. My mother wrote my talk. <laughs> now you've got to remember that I was a seminary graduate, that I'd grown up and was the president of my quorums in the Aaronic Priesthood program, that I was the son of a mission president, lived in the mission field for four years. My mother wrote my missionary talk when I left. She did a good job. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that talk. She made me memorize it. And I had to practice it in front of the mirror over and over and over before I gave it. In fact, it formed a lot of the first talks I gave in the mission field. <laughs> when I came home, my life had changed and I gave my own talk. My mother critiqued it when I was finished. But some of the things my mother shared with me, Brian, I'd like to share with you because I think they're important about missionary work. The first one is found in Alma chapter 17 of the Book of Mormon. You remember the story of Ammon and his brothers, the sons of Mosiah, who with Alma the Younger had at one time gone about causing havoc in the church. They were converted in a miraculous way and once converted, determined that they would spend the rest of their service in preaching the gospel to the Lord's children. They were called on a mission to the Lamanites, which were, is where Brian has been called to serve. Whether they were in Caracas or not, we don't know. They were in the land of Nephi, which was where the Lamanites dwelled. Perhaps it was near Caracas. But you'll recall that uh, Alma had resigned his job as the chief judge of the people and had retained his position as uh, president of the church, prophet over the church. And while the sons of Mosiah had been out preaching to the Lamanites, Alma had been governing the church and the country in Zarahemla. And realizing that the Nephites were slipping away spiritually, he resigned the chief judgeship and spent the rest of his life out preaching the gospel to his people, the Nephites. So you had the sons of Mosiah preaching to the Lamanites and you had Alma preaching to the Nephites. They met in the land of Gideon, south of Manti. 
after 17 years of not seeing each other, they met. And Alma records in chapter 17, verse 2 and 3, the message of their reunion together. I'd like to share it with you and especially with Brian. Talking about the fact that these sons of Mosiah were with Alma at the time that the angel first appeared to them, therefore Alma did rejoice exceedingly to see his brethren. And what added more to his joy, they were still his brethren in the Lord. Yea, and they had waxed strong in the knowledge of the truth, for they were men of a sound understanding, and they had searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God. But this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore, they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. And when they taught, they taught with the power and authority of God. Now, Brian, if you can take a leaf from the page of Alma and the sons of Mosiah and your missionary service. Those two verses in Alma 17 are perhaps the greatest counsel that a missionary could receive in his service in the kingdom. I urge you to ponder on it and to do it, and your mission will be a great success. In the Doctrine and Covenants section four, I won't take time to read this, but the Lord sets forth the qualifications for those who are to labor in the ministry. There are seven verses there. As you enter the mission home, unless things have changed in the last 22 years, Elder Tolbert maybe can tell us if it's still the same. They will, or the Mission Training Center, they will instruct you to memorize these seven verses. Is that right, Elder Tolbert? Do they still do that? They don't do that? Well, then, then Brian, I'm going to instruct you to memorize these seven verses. Doctrine and Covenants section four, those seven verses that talk about the qualifications of one to serve. You have many of these now, Brian, but it's important for you to continue to work on them and to add to them those which you need to develop. And finally, I don't want to talk very long because I want to hear Brian talk. In section 62 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse three, this promise to those who go forth to serve. Nevertheless, ye are blessed, for the testimony which ye have borne is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon, and they rejoice over you, and your sins are forgiven you. Nevertheless, ye are blessed. For the testimony which you have borne is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon. And they rejoice over you, and your sins are forgiven you. What a powerful promise to those who serve as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ in all the world. We love you, Brian. We invoke every good blessing of the Lord upon you as you go forth to serve. May you be protected and watched over, and may you be powerful in the spirit because you have prepared and qualified yourself for the work. We love you. We will be praying every day for you and know that there will be many lives blessed and changed because of your service, not the least of which will be your own. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
pair. And uh, used to sing, I hope they call me on a mission. But nowhere in that song did it say anything about standing up in front of a bunch of people and giving a talk. So all you kids, this is part of the deal. <laughs> but um, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about getting my call. I was fast asleep one morning, and my little sister, Cheryl, came running into the room. She was yelling, it's here, it's here. And um, I was still about halfway asleep. And I told her, just put it on the table, and I'll get to it later. But uh, she didn't let me get away with that. <laughs> so I sat up in bed, and, and then I started thinking, you know, this is where I'm going to be for the next year and a half. So I started to get a little tense and a little nervous. And I opened it up, and, and I don't know how many people have seen missionary papers, but when they say papers, they mean papers. I mean, there's about seven or eight of them. And I was fumbling through them all, and I finally got to the one with President Kimball's shaky signature at the bottom. Unlike most missionaries, I just didn't start reading from the top down. I just looked for a place right at the first paragraph. And um, I found Venezuela Caracas Mission, and I was pretty excited. Um, I know I'd always like to go down South America. And uh, I told my sister, Cheryl, that I was going to Venezuela, and she got really happy and really super excited. And I asked her what she was so thrilled about, and she said, well, that's where Fernando's from, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I told her, no. <laughs> Close. <laughs> but um, I was happy. She was happy anyway. And um, a couple of days ago, <clears throat> as I was talking to my mom about what I should speak about, she um, told me I should tell why I wanted to go on a mission. And uh, I started thinking, and many reasons started coming into my mind. And, um, the one big reason that first stuck out into my mind, mainly because I don't know too many scriptures yet about missionary work or anything, but, um, and I guess you could say this one was a little selfish, but it, I really, I really like the thought and it conveys to me. It's found in Doctrine and Covenants section 18, verses 15 and 16. And it reads, And if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring save but one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. And now, if your joy will be great with one soul that you have brought unto me into the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls unto me. I know right now that these are going to be very important to me in the mission field. And hopefully when things aren't going so well, like I hear so many times it'll happen, I can look back and get my needed strength from them. Um, right now, I'd like to thank the people who are responsible for me being up here today to Brother Gilbert Gould um, for keeping me awake at 6 o'clock in the morning in seminary class and for giving me um, the counsel on my mission concerning how it would help me immediately in my life. And I know I'll thank him. He's a great person. I, and of course to Bishop Beardall and President Moss for the great leadership abilities that they have and the great examples that they've been to me and then to all the Sunday school and primary teachers that have put up with me through all the years and most of all to my mother and father 
my great family. My mother is such a strength to me. As well as my father. And I don't tell him much, but I love him. And he's a great man. And I hope someday I can be like him. I thank him for the example he gives to me, to my brothers and sisters. I know my sister's glad I'm gone because she gets my room when I leave. But I love them all, and I hope you don't forget me when I'm gone, but I like to hear from a lot of people. Keep me up to date. What's going on? And I'd like to close right now by saying that I know that Spencer W. Kimball is a true prophet of God and an inspired. And I know that Jesus is the Christ, and that He is my personal Savior, and that He lives today. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm grateful to, to spend a few moments. I remember some 20 years ago, it was 20 years ago for me that I was called on a mission. I'm not quite as old as President Moss is. Although I was 19 when I left and he was 20, so that might make up for a little bit of a difference. I remember having arrived in, in the mission field and having been there for about two days. And we had a mission conference. It was being held in Tokyo, Japan. And I remember one large very tall, very large, red-headed elder who stood up in a testimony meeting there and I believe taught me probably the greatest missionary lesson that, that I learned and really set the stage for the rest of my mission and I was grateful that it happened at that particular time. He was a, an elder who was not prone to, to tears as much as many of the other elders were. But at this time, I remember him standing there, tears streaming down his eyes, down his cheeks. And he said, elders and sisters, do you know that we are truly, in every sense of the word, ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that set the tone of my mission. And Brian, if I could share with you any of my experiences, I would share with you that. Probably some of the last words that were spoken by our Savior Jesus Christ before his final ascension to his Father in Heaven are found in the book of Acts. The first chapter of the book of Acts, or any records that has been recorded, it isn't a definite quote from him, but it, uh, it is said that, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, for the Father hath put it into his own power, but ye should receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria, 
unto the uttermost part of the earth. And I believe that that includes Caracas, Venezuela. Brian's been called by a prophet of the living God to be an ambassador for the living Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel, to share his testimony, to give that life-giving water to those good people down there. President Moss alluded to Section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants and did not take the time to read it, but I'm going to take the time to read it. We were commissioned as we entered the mission home in Salt Lake to memorize this. This is one of our missionary scriptures, and we were told that this should be a, a foundation for everything that we should do, the directions we should go, the things that we should remember constantly as missionaries. And if you recall, this was given by the Prophet Joseph Smith to his father, Joseph Smith Sr., in 1839, or 1829, before the church was formally organized in 1830. Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Now, Brian, there are going to be families that you will meet down there, people who will never have heard of the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They will probably have heard of the, the Christian religions and so forth, but they will have not heard of the Church. And that marvelous work will break forth into their lives as a result of your desire and your acceptance of a mission call. Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand blameless before God at the last day. Now there's an important concept there. I believe it was President Kimball quoting President John Taylor, who said that we may be held accountable to those whom we could have converted if we had done our duty. And Brian, you're doing your duty. You are going out into the mission field and accepting a call. You're standing out in the world. It's not a, a common thing for young men or young women to go out into the world to preach, to, to give their time and to be self-sustaining and self-supporting. So you have been called and you have that challenge. Therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. I feel it a great blessing in my life, both as a bishop, because Brian is the first missionary that will be leaving from this ward since I have been called to be bishop, and I feel it a great blessing to know Brian as a father. I have four sons. And I would that they would follow your example. Verse 4, For behold, the field is white, all ready to harvest. And lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store, that he perisheth not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. And faith, hope, charity, and love, with an eye single to the glory of God, qualify him for the work. Remember faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened up unto you. I don't believe there's any greater advice that I could leave than those words given by our Lord to a prophet of God. Brian, we're proud of you. It's a blessing to have you serve from the Long Beach 11th Ward. Our prayers will be with you. May the Lord bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We thank all those that have participated on the program and all those that are with us today. We'd like to mention that at the home of Brian's father, 
Max Baxter, which is at 5702 Monlaco. Did I pronounce that right, Jill? From 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. today, there will be an open house, and all are invited to attend there. We'll now close our meeting by singing from page 47, God Be With You, after which Brother Chris Harleen will give our benediction. Our kind and righteous Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the spirit that we have felt this day and for the love that Brian shares with all of us and with his family. Please, Father in Heaven, watch over Brian as he goes into the mission that thy spirit will be with him and that the hearts of those that he speaks with will be open and receptive to thy gospel. Please bless all the missionaries in the field that, that thy spirit might be with them. We're thankful for all the gospel brings into our lives. Please continue to watch over us through this day and always. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Say anything?
Jeannie lets have a narration. It's